Welcome to Coffee and Code, a monthly video podcast for Acumatica developers by Acumatica developers. Coffee and Code is meant to uh, be a casual conversation among developers around various topics where we share developer best practices, experiences, and miscellaneous knowledge. We'll have various guests with expertise centered around uh, a specific topic of interest uh, released on a monthly basis, engaging with members of our developer MVP community who you can see are with us here today. If you missed last month's episode of Developer Processes with uh, Sergey Marinich, you'll be able to find that recorded video on acumatica.com slash developers, a place where you can find all of our developer-focused content. The specific role is uh, providing the text of this blog for this episode. And now sit back, relax, get, a, get your favorite cup of brew, coffee, or any beverages of your choice, and enjoy the conversation. So here's my sip. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I've got my coffee right here. All right. Today, I'm right, uh, excited to have Steve Holglum, a relatively new addition at Acumatica, a former longtime architect and evangelist at Microsoft, who I was fortunate enough to work with some years ago. An outstanding hire for us, for sure. Stephen is here to talk uh, with us about SSL and security. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, please uh, provide a little more information about yourself and a little background and context on the topic today. Sure. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Coffee and Code today. Uh, we're in this recording, of course. Uh, like uh, Mark said, I, I've come to uh, Acumatica after quite a long career at Microsoft, as well as um, a little shorter, abbreviated one at Hilla Packard. I primarily worked in areas that were technology focused, um, if not 100, almost 100%, even though I was on sales, it was a lot of architectural work for big counts, or in the developer platform evangelism group, it was about basically uh, securing the hearts and minds, as we used to say, of developers uh, to basically move over to .NET because many of them had adopted Java at that point, and this was like 20 years ago. So uh, come rolling the clock forward, um, I decided I, I wanted to do something different than be retired. So <laughs> I talked to a few folks and here I am. And so I've come to you with a, kind of a hodgepodge of backgrounds. I, I go all the way down to the wire because I'm an electrical, I have a master's in electrical engineering, but I also uh, did software development way back in you know early days when it was 16-bit machines. and unix machines and all that kind of thing i even uh uh know what a 128 hollow earth card punch is an ibm card punch i don't know if any of you guys have ever dealt with hollow earth cards or paper tape or any of those things prior to actual I you know did. terminals but uh if you have great because <laughs> are you trying to call us out and age all of us or at least some yeah, of us because well, yeah. i'm giving away my age my wife keeps telling me don't bring that stuff up because that's you know that's back in the 70s Golly, yeah. but I was I was around when the Apple Mac actually was invented, and I actually knew the guy. The guys were on that team, and I had met uh, um, Steve uh, uh, Wozniak. Yeah. He was working at HP in 1976. So, and they were on a project that had to do with this graphics terminal. It was basically a terminal I hung off MP3000, MPE3000 or HP3000s, and uh, he got tired of management keep telling him well we're not going to fund this project and so he left and lo and behold a couple years later in a garage and just up the street in Palo Alto boom we got Apple so uh, I met all kinds of all kinds of crazy people you know the same thing happened with Cisco I met those guys Dan Worman oven and all these so anyways I, I've interacted with a lot of different people in my career too so I, I have a lot of inter anecdotal stories about uh, Bill Gates, for instance, I've been in the car with him many times on the way to you know, major accounts or Steve Ballmer or, or Paul Moritz, if you guys remember who he was, or Bob Muglia, who uh, was the CEO recently of Snowflake. And so and, and you know, others like Kevin Johnson, who's the CEO of Starbucks, <laughs> he and I go all the way back to when I first joined. So so there's a lot of fun, a lot of friends, a lot of fun things to talk about on the side. If I meet you at the summit, maybe I'll share some of those stories with you. 
All right, today's topic. Uh, one of the things that I was doing when I first came on board to RAMP was I basically wanted to understand uh, the system a lot more deeply than I did. Uh, I actually uh, got to get my hands dirty on it before I was interviewed by um, the chief product officer, but he, uh, and he, he afforded that to me. But I was very impressed, uh, to say the least, about how Acumatic was going about architecting an ERP system. Having come from Microsoft, working in the Dynamics AX team, and knowing how that was architected, and it was architected, you know, back in the 90s. Uh, basically, uh, the bottom line was that uh, uh, I wasn't, there were always faux pas in any of these implementations. I, I worked on SAP, I've worked on Oracle, I've worked on uh, played with NetSuite, and, and the bottom line is everybody's got these faux pas, and I was just, what's the faux pas for Acumatica? You know, what's the, where's the hole? And, you know, uh, every, everybody's got imp imperfections, and I'm not going to say Acumatica's by any means perfect, but at the same time, one of the things that I really was impressed with was how they handled customizations. And I'm not going to get into that today. But I think a lot of you can appreciate the, the fact that you can the fact that you can carry a lot of these customizations forward with minimal work, if not in some cases none, and or you just read the release notes and you know what you have to go in there and tweak. That's really remarkable to me, considering that you had to rewrite everything in a lot of these other previous ERP systems in order to move them and or get an upgrade. And so that was one of the reasons I was curious because you guys are the Acumenic upgrades every six months. And I'm like, well, that's wonderful. So Back on track, the the the, uh, the key thing I was being assigned was I started getting these technical cases, and one that kept popping up pr quite often was partners complaining about getting demo instances to work with Outlook, or getting demo instances to connect to the tax service, or getting uh, basically getting HTTPS to work at all because they wanted to demonstrate you know security for data in transit. And so I thought, well, I'm redoing this. I'm re retelling everybody how to do this. And I thought, this is really one of those areas where I need to scale myself. And that's when I took a few uh, few days and I said, well, what am I going to do here? Am I going to just redo another paper and show them how to click and point and click? And or am I going to solve this? Because one of the uh, previous uh, documents said something basically, go to Internet Services Manager, click here, right click here to get self-signed certificates and then you're gonna and you're gonna still get errors in the browser but and what boils down to it it never worked and it still doesn't work and it's not going to work and we're going to talk about that but the bottom line was that i kept seeing these people asking how do i get this to work and i said well let me look into it and i found out what was going on was that iis for whatever reason wasn't sticking the cert that it created in the right store and we'll talk about that in a second but there are several certificate stores in Windows. There's the root, there's your personal one, and then there's the web server store. So there's three of them, and they're basically associated with what they call local computer or user or um, application. There's stores for applications, there's stores for users, and there's stores for um, you know, uh, the, the system itself, the PC. And most of the, the PC uh, certificates go in the root. Well, that's why this wasn't working. So the second I placed it in the root, I said, well, that's great, but how do I get that in there now in an automated fashion? So having been a PowerShell uh, enthusiast for many, many years, I said, well, I'll just write a script. And this is why I'm here today, because I did write this script. A Joy and many others have looked at it and were very excited that you know, this was the, that doable. And so I thought we'd go through that script a little bit. but. First of all, I thought we could go through a quick PowerPoint presentation uh, just for a few minutes because I know how we all hate PowerPoint. So just a quick definition, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, SSL is actually a, no, uh, a misnomer. It, it used to be a real technology back in the 90s and the 80s, but technically it's not what we use anymore. We're actually using something called Transport Layer Security or TLS. And it's gone through a few reps. It's gone from 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2. And presently, it's in a sort of pseudo-adopted uh, TLS 1.3. Uh, who's responsible for this tech, uh, the specifications? It's the IETF, the 
Internet Engineering Task Force. And if you go to their IETF.org website, you can get all kinds of uh, insomnia uh, curing documents there to read at night and it'll knock you out. So the bottom line is that uh, it's TLS and I'll refer to it as uh, that throughout the presentation, but most people still use uh, Secure Sockets Layer or SSL acronym. Um, technically, they were both doing the same thing. They were, correct, they were basically encrypting data in transit on a wire over an HTTP uh, transport protocol but they do it differently. And even uh, the versions of TLS that has gone through the 0 0.0, 0 0.1.2, and now 0.3 are actually different as well. Now, what comes with that difference is the fact that the browsers have to respond to it. And this is where it gets a little bit uh, hacky because uh, Firefox, Mozilla, Safari, Opera, uh, Edge, Chrome, and I'm sure there's probably two other browsers out there I don't have on my machine right now. But bottom line is they, I've, I've tested them in a couple of scenarios and they all responded differently. And it was around this area. It wasn't around a lot of other areas, but it was around the, how they handle self-signed certificates. They're very picky. And what I'm seeing is they're getting pickier. And that's why a lot of people have been running into this issue of how to get Outlook to work with a demo instance on a self-contained laptop, let's say, or a desktop, uh, or even up in a, uh, uh, a cloud VM. Uh, all of three of those are basically just a single machine and you're um, trying to instantiate and hydrate a, a whole system so you can demo it, demo it. So I thought what we could do real quickly is, is just what is uh, SSL or TLS.1.2 and it's very, very straightforward protocol, basically. It, it, you've got a client and a server, and basically the client is just gonna basically ping the server and say, hey, I wanna connect to you. But it'll also do so with over an HTTPS connection. So it's gonna come through port 443, which is the default port for uh, a secure connection. Typically, you're, you can you ping the server at, on port 80, but if you actually start on port 80, the server will flip you over to it if it insists that you use an SSL connection on the server side. So one way or the other, you're going to ping the server and you're going to basically get back a, a response from the server that's going to have a cipher in it. And it's basically a shared key um, cipher. Basically, it's going to tell you it's public key and it's going to basically tell you um, what you need to do to it. That's the signature and the certificate or the thumbprint. And so what the client then does is it responds with that public key, but it does generates a random number and it sends it back to the server. And, it, and the server knows what that number is because they share that, that, that uh, secret, if you will. And the server then basically unfolds it with its private key and knows that, yep, this is a, a legitimate connection, as well as the client knows that because I use your public key and it's a well-known key and, and you were able to talk to it, that the server is actually authentic. So that's where you get into step three, which is keyed shared. And basically that that's a private public key or an asymmetric key pairing. And one thing that uh, probably confounds people is that there are really two major types of cryptography. And there's one that's called key share or share or, sym or symmetric keys. And that's uh, that's typically what it's used in email or S-MIME and, and other types of kind of one-way um, uh, communications, but it's very, very fraught with administrative problems because you got to get your key over to the other side somehow and, and share it with them. And so uh, another uh, technology for cryptology is called asymmetric keys. Uh, uh, and there's a huge bunch of stuff you can go up on Wikipedia and, and, and engorge yourself on all the content and what that all means. But technologies like uh, previous Kerberos and all, they're all based on this idea of sharing a, a private and a, a, a public key. And the public key then can be made known to, to the world, but only the user that owns that public key knows its private key. That's your secret. And if you're familiar with tokenization today with OAuth 2.0, that's exactly what it's doing. It's basically letting you know what your key ID is, which is your public key. And then you've got this secret, and that that secret is what you're going to use to, to identify yourself, and only you should have that. 
So it's very similar. It's not exactly an asymmetric key pairing uh, as we're talking about here, but it's it's close enough as an analogy that you might be familiar with. But as you can see, once you once you basically get into this keyed share state, you're using HTTPS. Well, what is HTTPS and what is what is you know what is all this stuff? What you can also see is that, like I said, a lot of browsers are starting to move to TLS 1.3. Uh, it's not enforced, TLS 1.2 is, but a lot of companies are now turning off 1.0 and 1.1. And by the way, you can go into Chrome or Edge or all these browsers and turn this stuff on and off. But bottom line is you're using the HTTP protocol, which runs over TCP IP, and you're basically doing these interactions. Well, one of the things that they wanted to do with 1.3 is they wanted to make the interaction much less uh, time consuming. So you can see that they actually cut off uh, almost 30% of the milliseconds that are required to do a full handshake. And this is a good graphic that shows that, but it also shows what we were talking about previously of what the client pings the server, the server responds, the client responds, does the key exchange and so forth. So this is actually useful to know just as anecdotal you know, for developers because you're gonna run into this all the time. Security is the anathema of, of ease of use, as we all know, it's the reciprocal. So the more secure it is, the less easy it is to use. And so the more we can make security transparent as developers and make the system own it and make it the system own it in a way that's you know centrally administrable, then the, the more power we have, uh, the more power to us and the less we have to do as developers. We can just let the infrastructure take care of it. But in the years gone by, you know, a lot of developers had to deal with this stuff and because it was all one off and it was all basically had to be a part of your application. Good news, we don't need to anymore, but this is what's going on underneath the covers uh, when we get to that. So basically SL, SSL 3.0 came out in the mid nineties and it was actually deprecated six years ago. It technically is not used anymore, even though some people still use it. Because uh, you can still turn it on on some uh, front ends or, or uh, uh, firewalls and stuff, but most of them basically will not, you know, will not accept it. And as you can see, there's even a deprecation plan for TLS 1.1, which is last year, and that's in that's actually in process. So TLS 1.2, which came out in 2008, is basically been the lion's share of what's been going on on the internet up to this point. As you can see, TLS 1.3 was released just a couple of years ago, and it's starting to starting to take on, just like w, uh, WPA 3.0 was released last year or a year and a half ago, both of them are starting to take on more adoption. Um, I wish Hewlett Packard printers would adopt WPA 3, but I don't know what, you know, what century they're gonna do that. So don't turn WPA3 on your router at home because your printers won't work anymore. Uh, but that's that's neither here nor there. So what I thought I'd show you real quick is uh, these are the in, the browsers. You can see all the browsers across here. There's a few here I did mention, but a lot of them are just because they run on mobiles. But you can see the adoption, <laughs> and it's all over the place. And that's what the the challenge of doing any kind of um, kind of ubiquitous thing with SSL is because all the browsers which are going to rely on it, you know, depend on different artifacts and or different parts of the spec, and or they they really are tight on some parts of the spec and they're not tight on the other parts of the spec. So as you can see that you know they're all over the place as far as uh, adoption goes here, and, and in some cases they aren't adopting it yet. And I thought yeah, I'd show you that how TLS 1.3 is going right now. And you can see that Firefox is probably the leader in this area, oddly enough, and Opera is right behind it. And you can see that Chrome is trying to, you know, edge up on Opera here, but Edge is way behind. And IE, well, IE is basically deprecated by Microsoft. So, and, you know, don't even install it if you can avoid it. Uh, so bottom line, browsers are uh, going to be all over the map. And if you run into a case where your customer says, I'm trying to use uh, SSL or I'm trying to use uh, HTTPS to, to log into my instance uh, and use the Outlook add-in, and I'm getting this error about some sort of certificate or token error or something like that, chances are you're going to want to ask, what browser are you using? What version are you on? Have you updated it recently? And those are all things that are really important when it comes to um, to the browsers. 
So I'm going to go back to well, I'm not sharing screen. And so what I did was um, you might ask, well, why not VPN? Somebody asked that. Why not what? VPN, Steve? Why not VPN? Because, you know, that's what VPN came around, all right? Virtual private networks. Uh, a lot of companies set up VPN so that you could get into the corporate net from the public side uh, in a secure fashion, right? You're tunneling through the IP6 address, IPv6. So but bottom line is VPN provided a means in which to get to the corporate net. That's a different problem than what HTTPS solves. HTTPS solves is a point-to-point -point solution that just encrypts data in transit from point A to point B, so from client to server, that's it. But if you wanna get onto the corporate net and have just ubiquitous access to file servers and applications and all that kind of stuff, well, yeah, you could use HTTPS, but you're gonna to wanna to tunnel through something that also does a lot extra layer of security, and that's what a VPN does. So a lot of companies still employ VPNs. And um, we do here at Acumatica, even though a lot more of our servers are becoming more public facing because we're using a single sign-on approach, which is you know another way to solve this problem and get rid of VPNs, is to basically make public your, your authentication mechanism, like using Active Directory or Google or Microsoft. They all support some form of uh, single sign-on technology today so that you can actually use them to authenticate rather than having to come into the corporate Active Directory, which would then require a VPN just to make sure you're, you're, you're who you say you are. So VPN is still worthwhile. It still, it still has its merits. People like to use it for hacking because they can, you know, they can hide their IP address. I won't get into the Red Book stuff, the Red Book hacker stuff, but uh, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do with VPN today. Some of it's malicious, unfortunately, but a lot of it's very, very practical. So it, it's still very, um, uh, very, very much needed. So how do you secure a demo instance? So one of the first things you're going to run into, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up another window here um, that has, no, that's not the right one. Here we go. That has my PowerShell script in it. We're going to, and I'll, I'll talk to it. So let me uh, share that with screen. So I don't know how familiar. Before we, before we go there, uh, does anyone, do any of you guys have any questions or want to share any experiences around this? What he's talked about so far? I can share about my experience, how I secured my demo instances. Like I just bought this SSL certificate for some small amount of money for five years, and that was enough for me. Yeah, that's certainly the, the best solution, to be frank. But it does cost money, and for whatever reason, people are reluctant to spend money. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand, but it cost me around 60 bucks for five years. So for me, it was like <laughs> a no-brainer if it was like 6k i would i would be concerned but yeah well you know yuri the the other aspect of that though is you need a domain name to secure that certificate and if you're just spinning up an instance on your laptop your laptop does you know is unless you're going to use your corporate domain and they're not going to let you get an ssl with their you know their cert root so you're going to have to create your own domain and of course that's an expense too because you, then you got to pay GoDaddy or somebody to or Google, you know, domains.google.com to host it. And then you got to administrate it because you're going to have to create a DNS zone for that cert in order for it to authenticate. So uh, it's not just the cert that costs money, it's also some of the administervia that you got to do to get the domain up and, and do, you know, some of your DNS work. And then you got to wait for it to propagate, which might take three days. So you can't even use it for a while. But uh, but you, it, you, it you is, mentioned this. <laughs> yeah, and you're in, I, I completely agree with you. It, if you really want a solid solution that gets away from all of the all the uh, havoc that these browsers are causing with self sign certificate, that's the best way to go. Yeah, you know, it might be your your best money you've ever spent is to go get yourself a, a, a certificate, whether it's a specific domain or it's a sub, you know. Or, a semi wild card one or a, or a full wild card one on your fully qualified domain name. That's the way to go. But then you're going to have to create yourself a domain 
uh, most likely for demos. And then you're going to have to make sure that you know how to administer a DNS. Now, that's not that tech, you know, not that hard. But if you haven't done it yet, it might be a little bit intimidating. And I do plan on doing a video on how to do that because I'm getting a lot of questions on that, especially if you have cloud instances uh, of how you set that up. But uh, let's go through what I did. So, basically. Okay. One more thing before we go, Stephen. Um, yeah. You just finished telling me that SSL is deprecated and isn't really there anymore. And then you're calling it an SSL cert. So is this really a TLS cert? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I fall into that same trap because, you know, when it all this all started out, it was always um, everyone used SSL because it was 1.0, 1 1.2 1 you know, or 2.0, 3.0. But as you just pointed out and I just pointed out you know, just a second ago, it is definitely TLS now, transport layer security. So if we want to be completely ACK, is that better? Um, yeah, Mark? that's better. But nonetheless, uh, what I did was I said, okay, well, let's let's find out how the mechanism works. And so I wrote it up. I don't know if you guys do this in, in some of your your um, just uh, donations or any of your GitHub stuff, but I, I kind of just always put a, a header in here. And I, this really is a readme.md file, but um, I you know I stuck it in here because I was thinking uh, I I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it, put it up on GitHub or not, but. Basically, I, what I've got here is just an explanation of what I'm doing. And uh, by the way, you guys can pick this up. It's up there on the portal, uh, dot my academic or academica.com. And if you just uh, search, uh, once you're in the portal, search for SSL or search for Outlook add-in, it, sh it should pop up. And then you can just download it from there. So the, the script is up there. Uh, so, and I explain a little bit about um, computer names and whatnot. So, one thing that everyone should be fully aware of is that when you create a, when you uh, have a new PC, it actually has a fully qualified name, but it defaults to something called Workgroup. And it's not really a fully qualified name in the sense of what the internet calls it. It's just, a, it's, it's a default kind of not net bias name. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what net bias was way back in the, file sharing days of the 80s. But it was an invention by IBM that made basically name lookups a little bit more easy. And so it was a way to also segregate the net around you know, work groups. Uh, that maturated itself into what we now call FQ, F, uh, fully qualified domain names, which is something dot something dot something. And usually the fully qualified part of it or the, the qualified part of it is the domain name dot com or domain name dot ru or or whatever country you in or however you you and nowadays they don't even enforce it you could i i've got a domain name as hoglum dot studio i mean you could put dot anything anymore you know, they used to be very picky about that but now the dot, after the last dot could be anything dot io it could be dot until the cows come home you know whatever so but that's that's uh, the first thing you need to know is that these certs have to know what machine it belongs to. And that's the number one thing that these certificates that you're creating that uh, TLS uses is it's called its SAN name or uh, its access name. And so if you look up cert SANs, this is the number one area that uh, these browsers are starting to choke on. Because this, there's a SAN that's called a self-signed SAN, and that's one they're starting to say, we're not going to support that. So th that's that's one of the issues that's coming up. But bottom line is that uh, the certificate needs a name. It needs to know what it's bond bonded to, because you can't put an IP address in a certificate, and you don't want to put an IP address in this certificate, because they change all the time. And that's the purpose of a domain name is a domain name is associated through a domain name server, DNS, a domain name server associates that name to an actual IP address. And that's where you can configure the IP address to be different things. Your web server's on this IP address, now your web server's on that IP address, but it's the same name. So it's a one-off obfuscation, or not obfuscation, but a uh, indirection that uh, helps you know, create an, an administrative a nicety, if you will, where you can keep the name and not have to glue the IP address to it. So what a fully qualified domain name is when you have the beginning of that something dot something dot something, 
and it's you know acumatica.com well a lot of people and a lot of the domains when you create them will automatically create www uh, even though a lot of websites don't require it anymore. In, in fact, most of them don't. But if you look at their domain zones, you're going to see an entry in there for that because it always gets created. www. Your, you know, your company name. Your education or org or, or your commercial or, or edu, you know, whatever you are. Or yeah, you can create your own. What's that? Subdomains and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't want to get down that rabbit hole too far, but the bottom line is the cert needs a name. And so when you go to your machine and you're going to self sign it, you can call it anything you want. Uh, because whatever you put after that whack whack on the HTTPS colon whack whack, that's what the cert will want, will insist on seeing. Well, I just happened to say, well, you know what? Since we're looping back on a, a PC, I'll just call it localhost because that's the traditional uh, machine name that we use when you use the loopback uh, TCP IP address, which is 127.0.0.1. That's just that's just poured in concrete in the TCP specification. So I just call it localhost, and it's localhost whack you know whatever you're you know you're going to connect to. And if your instance is called Acumatica ERP, it would be localhost dot or WAC uh, Acumatica dot ERP. But localhost is not a fully qualified name. It's just the machine name. And so uh, you could also, and I've done this with this uh, script, even though I'm not going to go into a great detail, I could actually join my localhost to dot Acumatica dot com. I create a cert for that, and that way I can actually get to it um, uh, very easily with Outlook and, and whatnot because the browser doesn't choke on it because it knows about acumatic.com as a being a fully quali or a qualified name out in the net. But I'm not inheriting the certificate's root because Acumatic goes out to RSA or somebody and they buy a root. I mean, they buy a root certificate, which is what all SSL certificates are going to branch off of. And I, if you go back and, and look at how all these certificates work, they, they're in a tree. And there's a there's fundamentally at the top of the tree only two companies, and RSA is one of them. I forgot the other one. But basically, RSA started in the Bay Area, and they, they have a root certificate. So if you go into Windows and you go into the cert, cert uh, manager, I don't know if you guys have done that before. Maybe we could, we could do that right away, real quick, uh, because that's actually really instructive. Um, where is my oh here it is uh if i just share my screen and maybe that would be easier um yeah here we go screen so you guys can see on my whole screen right now it's coming up yes okay so if you go in um uh but here you go so this is it's the certificate manager and you get you can actually get the way we just got to it here Notice it says up here certificates dash current user. So right now I'm running it in current user mode. And then you might ask yourself, well, how do I how do I actually get it to um, to run in the other mode? Well, that's what I was trying to get to. And I think it's MSC, M, just MMC. Yeah, there it is. And the way the way you get to that one is you can basically you go here and you say add a snap in. And the snap-in we're going to add in, and here are all the snap-ins. I don't know if you guys knew this, but all, all the yeah. snap-ins that are in the administrative group in Windows, they're all in here. And so you can create uh, a snap-in called certificates. And you just go there. And this is where you, you find out that there are actually three stores uh, for the certificate. There's the user store, the service store, or the app store, I call it, and then the computer account. So we're going to go to the computer account because that's where you want the machine certificate cert to, to actually be and then we're going to just do it here on this local machine so now i've got this here and then what we could do is just say okay and it's going to go to that same it look, it's a similar screen to this one up here except it doesn't say computer uh current user anymore it's, notice it says local computer here you guys see that yeah so yes. so it's got a lot of the same folders in there but this is um basically the root of the cert store for the machine Whereas this is the root up here for the cert store for my my personal store. So these are all these are all the certificates that go to with my user ID. 
Whereas the other one, <clears throat> this is all the certs that go with this machine. And the problem was, was that <clears throat> when IS was creating the self-signed uh, certificate, it was putting it in the wrong store. It was putting it in this store. And the one you want to put it in is actually the Trusted Root Certificate Authority store. And it wasn't putting it there. So that's why I decided, you know, instead of having people click and do all what you just saw me do, I'm heck with it. I'm going to just write a PowerShell script and, and have it do it for them. But that's basically what's going on is you're going to create a certificate in this certificate folder. And notice there already is one called local host, but it's for IS Express. But you can also create one in here. And this is the list of all of the uh, certs that are in, in uh, your machine. And notice that if you go back up here to the top, you can see that there's a geo, that, that was the other one, GeoTrust. That one is actually a, a, a root certificate, signing certificate. And then there's also a RSA in here somewhere. Uh, yeah, Secure Trust, there it is. So these basically are just a roots. And then you can see that when you, Microsoft uh, dumps an SSL certificate on your machine or a cookie with, with an SSL cert in it, Basically, what it's doing is it's also signing up and, and storing it in this certificate store. Now, just on a side note, this these certs are a real pain in the ass to, excuse my French, to manage. And so one of the key things that Active Directory did for most organizations was it centralized this store. So notice I'm saying local computer, but when I was creating it, notice the screen also had remote computer. And that's basically what Active Directory did, was it offloaded this store off each machine and it put it in a central place, which is where then the applications could go to authenticate or get certs. And that's that made it really easy to use that cert store across the whole uh, organization. So if you're working with a customer that doesn't have a central cert store, uh, just be aware of that, that it becomes an administrative nightmare handling especially asymmetric keys private and public parts. So let's go ahead and look real quickly then at the PowerShell script. Uh, I don't want this one. I don't want this. I want this one here. Now, for those of you that don't know where to get PowerShell, um, on my windows, I actually have it as the default. I didn't want the command window because you can easily get the command window in PowerShell and I'll show you how. But if you also want to know where it's stored in, in your store, it's down in the Windows, so it's in the W's. And it's usually called Windows PowerShell, and it's right here. So this is where you would actually go and fetch it. It's down in the Windows folder here called PowerShell. Now, five point something or another is the standard one that Windows ships with, but the PowerShell guys still exist, and they still are thriving at Microsoft. So, so if you, well, I think it was version or verse, something like that. Uh, I forgot the command because these commands are all over the place. Here we can go up here. <coughs> uh, Git version. That's what it was. Anyways, the bottom line is is that this is a 7.1 version, but for the most part, it, all it does is it handles some more you know asymmetric uh, uh, HTTP calling and things like that a little bit better than the the five one does. But they're both just fine. So anyways, if you go up to uh, portal.acumatic.com, you can download this thing, and it, I put a little bit of an explanation here. I don't know about you guys, but d documentation is always very important, and <laughs> it keeps your phone from ringing. Uh, and and so, very much neglected by a lot of developers, unfortunately. Yeah, it is. So what I did was here, and this is kind of a little technique I, I did a long time ago, is I, you know, as I do version numbers, <laughs> I just, you know, basically this is creating uh, uh, a, if you will, a, a variable in PowerShell. Variable start with a dollar sign. And I'm just giving it that value so that I know what it is. And then one of the things I'm asking for is, did, the, did you pass any args in? Uh, the best way to use the script right now is just to use, just type the script. Don't, don't actually put any args in there because uh, I, I basically commented this stuff out so you couldn't do it because <laughs> uh, I needed to debug that a little bit more. But bottom line is I'm doing a quick test. You know, is this an, a fully qualified name, which means you put an arg in there that said something dot something, and I'm going to ignore it. Now, for those of you that haven't used PowerShell, um, this is a very important step. 
are you guys familiar or are people in the audience familiar with execution policy in Windows? Yes, by default, uh, it is. Yeah, uh, if you're going to do remote procedure calls, you're going to do any kind of remote computer access. Uh, Windows got really anal, you know, back at, in the Windows XP days after all those hacks that, you know, Microsoft suffered from in the early 2000 rate area. And they, they, they locked the whole system down. And this was one area they really were very, very, very deep in. And that is to not let things execute that didn't have permission. And not only did they not install everything as a default, but there was certain things they just weren't going to let execute without you, you know, going in there and actually setting it. So you're going to have to copy, uh, copy this this actual uh, phrase here because you're going to use it in your PowerShell script before you even run anything. And unfortunately, I was trying to I was trying to actually you know make this automatic. I don't know why copy isn't working here weird i'll just control c it then you don't have permissions ah. <laughs> there control c works i don't know why the the right click doesn't but you guys can you guys see it there i put it in here mm -hmm. yeah. and when you do when you do this all what i'm saying is basically i'm setting execution policy and the scope is process so i'm i'm saying for processes I want your ex, uh, the execution policy to be bypassed. In other words, ignore it. And if I do that, you see this big, huge dialog box coming. Do you really want to do this? And do you want to do it for all time, or do you just want to do it for this one process, et cetera, et cetera? So I invite you to read up more on this about execution policy because it's a very deep Windows topic. But what I've just done here is I've said, allow this script to run. Because if I don't, it won't. And so now if I were to just go up here to the top, or where is it? Oh, I think that, I lost my tool, oh, there it is. If I just run the script now, it runs. And you can see what it just did, was that it configured this machine to have a local host, and it was that fast. And we'll go through the code real quick, but this is what it did right here. It got my computer name just so I knew what it was, but it's only it's not going to use that. It's just going to use local host. Self-signed certificate created and bonded to default website success. Boom, you're done. And this is how you would log in then to your instance is local host tenant name. And so if, when you install it with the uh, Acumatica ERP wizard, you always give it a tenant name. And you know a lot of times the default's Acumatica ERP. And then that's what I would type and this would work. So if we go back to the real quickly before uh, we go into the code, go back to that um, the manager, uh, this one here. If we go back to this manager, let's see what happened. So if you go here in the uh, oh I've got to refresh it. That's the other thing. You got this thing does not refresh unless you open things up. Refresh. Is this the right one? Yeah. Oh. Oh, here it is. I, I was just staring at it. I didn't realize it. This is the one I just created, 3-30-2022. Today is 3-30-2021, so it's, its expiration date is a year. But this was, the, this was the cert I just created. And basically, you can see all the details if you double-click on it here. Here's the thumbprint that's typically used for expediting. Uh, uh, signature check and so forth and so on. So I won't go into what certs are too deeply today, but there's all kinds of details here in this cert. But one of the things that you're going to notice is see what it says on the subject right here. This is the key thing for the cert, and this is what the browsers check. They check the subject field inside the certificate. And if it says localhost and your machine is named localhost, it's happy. If your machine isn't named localhost, or you're using an IP address in your HTTP URL, then it won't be happy because this has to match what it says in the in machine name of right after the whack whack. This has to be that. Otherwise, the certificate's worthless. So if you're going to use mobile access to your instance on your demo laptop, unfortunately, you're going to have to use an IP address, which means this cert won't work. Because and and then you have to go down Yuri's path, which is create your own. Uh, domain, add it to a DNS, and then get your own cert. Then you can get the mobile uh, phone to work fine. 
But for and then you have to make this machine, you know, give it a name in that domain. You'd have to join this machine to that domain. But bottom line is that's the field inside the cert that is it's very pick, picky about is this subject name or the SAN. This is basically what this is, that SAN we were talking about early, earlier. So here it is, and then it should be over here too somewhere. I didn't look really good. I don't know, is it here? No, it's not here. Oh, here it is. And this is where this is where th this right here. See how it's in this trusted root certificate authorities. My script stuck this over there. This is why it works. If I hadn't done this, which is what IIS manager doesn't do. IIS actually sticks it down here in the web hosting area. Right down here. The web hosting area is the wrong place because browsers aren't looking for it there anymore. So it needs to be in this search store, which is called root. And if you go down here, you can see um, that that's exactly where it is. It's right here, localhost. And it's the same exact cert if we look at the details. And notice that it's the issuer's localhost. It was issued today. And here's the subject. So this is what the, <clears throat> the shell script did. It put one here and it put one here. Notice also uh, when we uh, did this before, that there was an IIS Express one in here. Yep. Well, my script basically cleared that out. So if you need to do that again, you have to you have to actually go into IIS Manager and create a new one. But most of the time, most people don't use localhost. That's the only instance where it's actually used. And if you wanted to use a different phrase, we could change this, or you could get the script because it's it's publicly available and, and change it to my localhost or something like that. But whatever that is, that's what you've got to use in your <clears throat> URL to connect to the instance. So if we go back here to now the code, um, let me bring it down here. By the way, are you guys all familiar with ISE? This is just basically the IDE for PowerShell. Uh, most people are familiar with the script window, um, which is this thing here, right? This is the typical thing you see with PowerShell. But... Uh, uh, there's also a, an IDE for PowerShell called I, uh, PowerShell ISE, and that's installed in Windows every time you install PowerShell. And it's very, very handy because you can put your script in here, you can go over here and see all the commands, and you can go down here and run it, like as I just did earlier. Now, if I run it again, it'll just blow away the cert that's in that store and, and add a new one back in. So let's go through the code and talk about a little bit what's going on here. So the first thing the code's gonna do is it's gonna bring this module in, and this is real critical, is PowerShell works over modules, and there's all kinds of modules, and there, there, there's a whole list of them somewhere up on a Microsoft.com um, server up there. But basically, web administration has a lot, it's basically like a, a, a DLL, it has all of the call or all the uh, uh, classes in it, if you want to use a C-sharp uh, equivalent to that or namespace, uh, but basically it has all the Git, all the commands that the PowerShell can execute are inside this module. If you don't put this in here, it won't know what some of the commands I'm using down below are. And by the way, if you try writing something like this yourself, you'll run into errors right away. And so you'll know for sure that you need to put something in there. And this is the key module to import. And so after I've done that, I'm not going to go through all the code or you can you guys can look at it uh, yourself. But there's a couple of things that uh, are interesting here, and that is I've created these names here. Notice there's a computer name, domain name, website name, and I've just set these set these to defaults. A fully qualified name is computer name plus domain name, which are these two up here and or local, which is just local host. And that's the one I'm actually using. So here's the dialog box we saw on the screen just a minute ago. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have to create the certificate. Now this takes a little, took a little kind of banging around to figure it out uh, because you have to use this, this, uh, these indirects basically to get into the search store. But there's this thing called Get Children, which I guess would be equivalent to a, a like an enum in um, uh, in uh, C sharp. It's basically a, you know you're going to a path where there's a collection of things. And what you're going to tell it is where, what the path is to it. And that's what this thing right here does, cert colon. 
and most people probably aren't f familiar with that, but there's several there's several things you can put in front of that colon on Windows, and cert is one of them. Uh, HTTP is another. File colon is another. You can actually you know do file colon whack whack. Um, now notice that they're backslashes because that's what Windows looking is or uh, not Windows, but that's what the uh, the nomenclature is, is looking for here. Oops, I didn't want to do that. So uh, right here, what I'm doing basically is I'm looking to see which one you picked up here. If you're going to do fully or if you passed in an arg or whatnot. Uh, so if domain is not equal to null, do this. Otherwise, if domain name isn't there, then do this. And you can see it's just going to do local machine. But this my is the personal store. And this is the key thing I had to figure out was, and root is the machine store. So this is, these are the two stores you have to put the, these, the certs in. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to find out, well, is there anything in there? And if there is, remove it. And that's what basically the, these guys up here are doing, okay? And then it's also removing the local entries in, in the store here if if, uh, uh, if the overall thing is used fully qualified. So I basically had to be do some redundant code here in my if statements. So down, down here, I'm just basically uh, setting the scope, uh, and I'm going to use local machine as my scope and the store scope and the source scope and so forth. So basically there's this command called new object. And this is how you create your, your certificate. And because I've got that web administration up there as well as there's some just default modules that PowerShell uses, I'm using this basic type name for that's a type that's inside PowerShell to actually create a 509 cert. And five, X509, by the way, it was the X standard that basically uh, maturated into what they started using for certificates and that goes all the way back to x400 which was where email was trying to to you know become standard and x400 set up smtp and all that other stuff well x509 x the x500 work was to talk about cert, you know certificates and x509 is where the standard uh established this whole idea of what these cert, particular certs were going to look like and you can look that up on the internet too but there's this cryptography module that's basically built into the system security. And so what I'm basically calling on is I'm calling on that, this type, and basically I'm going to stick it in this source store. And then down here, I'm basically going to um, put it basically in the destination. And this actually, I had to figure out how to do this because this stuff is a little, the search stores are particularly uh, picky about how you do this. but uh, what you're ending up doing in this code is what I'm doing is I'm copying the cert from my folder to the root folder. This was a little tricky because I had to pull it out of the folder. You can't just do a copy from folder to folder. You have to actually pull it out and then put it back in. So um, because that's the only way that the cert store works. So that's basically what this code is doing up here. Up here I'm creating it and I'm sticking it into the local store or my store folder. And then here I'm pulling it out of the my store folder and sticking it into the machine root store and that's basically what it does now the last thing you have to do once you've got the cert in that store and let me uh, run is manager real quick to show you this is if you run is manager you're probably all familiar with this because you have to be in order to get a to cert to work anyways but at the default website, which I've, I've never have seen a reason why not to just leave this here like this, there's a bindings, um, edit bindings thing here. You can see that I've got this store called 443. That's not default for IS. You actually have to go in here and add this. And so if you do click add, it, I'll just click add it. It's going to ask you, okay, you want to you want to assign a, a port 443 to this server or this web server called default website. What certificate do you want to associate with it? And this is where you, you're pulling out that certificate out of that store. So as Yuri was talking about, if you, you go out in the open market and buy a cert, you'll probably get a uh, some sort of a PK something, P, a PFX file, a PK7 file. You're going to get some sort of a format um, uh, for that cert given back to you. And then you'll have to import it into the Windows server uh, using that cert manager and once you've been actually you can just double click on it half the time and it knows where to stick it but uh, it'll stick it in the cert store and then once it's in the cert store you're going to see it listed here and this is where you would pick it 
So this is how the certificate gets associated with the website. And this is what the notice they call it SSL in here too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, even the, even that's bad. But up here it says, what IP addresses am I going to allow to come in here? Well, I'm saying it's unassigned, so let them all come in. So uh, that's basically all you have to do is just tell the IIS what cert you're going to use on that port. So when I come in, I want to basically validate the machine name against that cert. And that's it. And so you can see that's that's basically the, the to to totality of you know how we use this manager because we don't use IIS other than the you know the very basic web server function that IIS has. We don't use any of this stuff, ISAPI filters, any of this stuff. So that's the only thing you have to do is you have to go in here and edit bindings. And if you notice underneath this, um, I don't have any installed in this machine right now because this is an, uh, a new build. But this is where under here you would see your uh, wizard instance of Ac you know, Acumatica ERP. There would be a, web, a virtual website underneath this website here. And any of the other instances you use the wizard to create instances, they all get listed here. Well, they're all under this default, so they're all going to benefit from that one cert. Now, if I put a different web server here, I can also associate that cert with it because it's on the same machine. Um, and so basically a, a certificate is associated with the name of the machine. So if I build a new machine uh, and I want to use that certificate, make sure you name the machine whatever is in the cert because you're going to want to make sure that that is equivalent. Otherwise, the cert won't, won't work. So that's basically the kind of the fundamental nitty gritties. So what I need to do in my script is I've got to actually do what I just showed you in the UI. I've got to associate this cert that I just created and I got to stick it in uh, and associate it with the, the web uh, binding, going into that edit bindings like we did in the UI. And this is basically the commands in, in PowerShell to do that is first I'm gonna see if there's anything there and if there is something there, I'm going to get rid of it. And then I'm going to basically take the thing I just created. And notice I'm, I'm only going to use local here because I turned off the other stuff. But I also was trying to play around with fully qualified names here. And I'm just going to stick that thing that I've got in my, my cert store. And I'm going to stick it here in this other cert or other store windows called IIS colon WAC. So here's another store that's inside Windows. And I'm going to stick it in a folder called SSL bindings, and that's where IIS looks for it. And notice it's all zeros in the IP address because I said there's no assigned IP address to this. So that's basically what that means is I'm going to create a new item in this folder, and I'm going to use that cert store right here from this cert, and I'm going to stick it in this, this uh, folder here for IIS. And then press the change it, you're done. So again, a recap, all I, I really did up here was I just determine what kind of a cert you wanted based upon if you had args or not. And then I go ahead and I create the cert down here. And then once the cert is created, I move it over into the other root store because it's not automatically created there. It's created in my store, the personal store. So I got to move it over to the root store. And then once it's moved over to the root store, I've got to assign the, the certificate just like you would normally do to a website. And that's what this section does. And so then you get your nice little uh, message at the end, you know, that you did it and everything's working hunky dory. So if we run it again, um, you're going to see this. If we run it again and I scroll back up there, that's basically what you get. Yeah. Any questions? Steven, at the beginning of this, you said some security uh, setting that basically said, hey, I know I'm going to do something that you don't want me to do, but do it anyway. Yeah. Well, am I able to, to to do that on one machine that's maybe isolated from the rest of my network? If my sysadmins like to uh, clamp things down pretty hard, can I do that on a separate machine and then export the cert from that machine already created with whatever I need that uh, that machine name to be, and then yeah, import it on the machine where I want it? Yep, you could do that. Sure, you could do cool. it on your 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 laptop. You know, your home laptop if you want. Because this this is going to create whatever you tell it. And right now, the default, it'll create a local host cert. Okay, but it also will stick it in your machine's sto two stores. So what you're going to need to do is when you create the cert, you're going to have to export that cert on the remote machine. 
put it on a USB drive or something or, or email it to yourself or, you know, however you're going to get it over to the server. And then you got to rehydrate it into the cert store. So, you know, you have to have access to the server cert store in order to stick it in there. Um, the first part of the shell will create it, but it will also stick it in the cert store of the local machine you're running on. So the trick then will be to be able be able to take that certificate you just created and stick it on the server. And once That's you've done that, uh, you you could you could possibly you know, uh, as long as you're you're um, able to create the cert, which is really the tricky part of, on this particular thing, and stick it in that trusted uh, um, certificate store that we were talking about here, this one here that says trusted root certificates. Uh, as long as you're able to get access to that and stick that exported cert back into here, you're golden. Then you just go to the IIS manager and associate it with your port. Did you follow that? I did. So that's pretty nice because that means that there's no validation that my machine is actually called what I told it I wanted to create the cert as, which yeah, means yeah. that I don't I don't have to worry about uh, the fact that when you when you have a a commercial certification, a certificate, you have to go create a request that validates all that information and send it up. I can just make it to be whatever I want, as long as the machine name matches on the machine that I'm going to install it so that everything gets back to it. So that when I install this, this custom certificate, then as long as my machine, uh, uh, as long as my networking is routing it through D an internal DNS or an external DNS, however I've done it, as long as it will route it to this machine's IP address, this, uh, this machine would know how to accept that response and match it up to that certificate. Absolutely. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, I turned it off right now up here at the top uh, using the fully qualified name. I just wanted to do a little bit more. Uh, it, by the way, if I run this on my Acumatica machine, it blows away my personal certs and I have to rejoin the domain. <laughs> so I, I had to figure out some way of not doing, you know, stomping on myself so that I could test it. And the, I just great use of time yet. Great I was use of put virtual it in a machines. VM and do it there, but what's that? Great use of virtual machines. Yeah, exactly. I was going to stick it in a VM, but I just hadn't gotten to it yet. Absolutely, because uh, if you put it on your uh, if your physical machine and you and you turn these things on, take these uh, these hash marks off, which is basically the comment you know in PowerShell, um, it'll basically you you give it a name. It'll it'll dutifully do it for you, but it'll also say, well, is that cert already in there? And it'll blow it away. <laughs> and unfortunately, there's a lot of certs associated when you join a domain to your machine name. <laughs> and so I, I needed to avoid that, and I just hadn't gotten into the logic for that yet. So it's all that's all turned off, so that won't happen. So uh, that's, version, that's version 2.0 or 1.6? Uh, it'll be 1.6. <laughs> I know if it was a minor version or a major version. Well, you know, it could be a major version the more I think about it. But yeah, how much work it is, right? Yeah, you got it. Um, but yeah, you know, everyone knows probably how, how you go about getting your uh, your own you know certificate over here. Um, like I said, when you do when you do self signed certificates, you go here to server certificates and um, oh, where I'm at the wrong one. Go to uh, where is it? Oh, so I'm the wrong one again. Sites. It's not confusing at all, Stephen. No, yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately, it can be. Um, <laughs> uh, where is oh, it? You need to actually open that. Open the feature. Is that? How, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I haven't used this surprise, thing in so long because I, I hate it. I, you know, this thing, this is like what it looked like, you know, almost 20 years ago. So, but here it is. This is where people would usually go is they create a self signed certificate right here. Now, to do what Yuri just was talking about, you have to create an actual certificate request. And what that does is it creates this blob of numbers that you have to cut and paste. And then you go to GoDaddy or whatever site's going to provide you your SSL, and you copy it in there. And then you then they basically tell you, okay, we've created your cert for you. Give us the money, and then we'll you know then we'll give you the PKS or the PK5 or seven or the PKX file, right? Or PFX exactly. file. Exactly. And that's it. Exactly. I mean, this is how you actually create a real SSL for your servers. You got to go here and create a request for it. 
So that basically is creating a machine cert for this machine, and you're sending it to the SSL guy in the sky that's going to collect your money, and they just basically crank on it and they join it into a, a, the proper tree. Uh, if they're GoDaddy, they've got their own parentage. And that gets back to that tree I was talking about because all certs have a parentage. A cert is a from a cert from a, you know, there, there has to be a trusted string for certs to actually mean anything. And so you, the ultimate is you got to go to God, I guess, you know, the RSA, and, and you got to be able to trust them, right? And then everything flows from that, you know, the secure trust or global trust, one of those guys. And all the certs are basically how, so Microsoft or Acumat, they all go to Global Trust or RSA and they get basically a root cert for their company. And then all the certs for Acumatica that ever get created uh, for our business internally, then all basically branch off that one. And you want them to branch off that one, otherwise the cert won't get trusted. And that's how you also get in revocation, you know, I don't want to get into certs too much, but there's revocation lists and all these things where certs time out, certs expire. If you guys have ever digitally signed a program, you guys do that because Windows requires it. Otherwise, it complains. Drivers and programs, certain programs. Uh, you run into a driver that's you know eight years old and the certificate they signed the driver with when they produced it is expired. And you can't install it anymore. So you, I don't know if you guys know this trick, but you got to reboot your machine and say, don't check that for right now. And then you install the driver and then you reboot your machine, turn it back on in the BIOS or in this, the fundamental boot manager in Windows. It's the only way around it. Uh, but yeah, these certs, they can be a pain in the rear. And like I said, security is the anathema of ease of use, but it's important that we do it. So this is where you would go to do that. This is where most people have gone to, to get a SSL for or their, notice that uh, I just said SSL, their TLS certificate for a self-sign, but, but this doesn't work. And Chrome won't work with it, Edge won't work with it. But if you use my script, it does work because it puts it in the right place. Where this puts it basically is like I said earlier, it puts it in that web store down here, web hosting. And they don't look for that anymore. I don't know why. I, I mean, it's still there, right? And, and, and when I create local hosts, it's, notice that the server actually stuck it there when I did a self-signed certificate you know, back in August. Uh, but uh, that's where it sticks it. And that's where I figured out, like, oh, it's sticking it there and it's not sticking it up here in the trusted root certificates. And this is where Chrome and the rest of them are looking for it. So that's kind of my, was my ha ha moment. That's why it led me to the PowerShell script. So does that mean we could create the self sign start the way we used to? We just need to go move it to the right folder, and we should still. Well, be good? you know what, you could do that too. Um, I I think so. I mean, there's a there is a there is a designation when you look at these certs. Um, let me look at one. Uh, let's look at this one. There's a designation in there, and I forgot where it is. It could be in the – it might be in the um, – see, notice here's the machine name, the SAN, uh, subject alternative name. Um, so basically the subject name – and this, this is where the, those browsers look, and if it's self-signed, this basically I have this machine – your machine name in it, and that's what they, they choke on. But the, I think it's in the thumb thumbprint. If you look at edit properties, um, it's in here somewhere. Oh, here it would be in this list right here. It say notice it just says server authentication. If we go to the other one, the local host one, in up here, it I think it says something different there. And we edit property. See, it says server and client authentication. It's the client authentication that's missing, and that's why this works. If you do self-signed certificate with IIS, it only creates a server authenticated, and that's why self-signed, you know, same subject or SANS, uh, they don't work. So I haven't tried that, Brian, but you know, give it a shot and let me know. <laughs> it wouldn't be that hard to just do it right here, actually drag it up here and try it, but. Um, because you can drag and drop these things inside the manager. You just can't do it in the code. Well, that's what I had for you guys. All Don't right. Well, we, uh, I'm going to end this and just say thank you, everyone, for joining. And Steve, for uh, all the great information. I think a lot of us developers, you know, have uh, 
don't focus on this as much as perhaps we should, but getting ahead of this and having a, a elegant way to, you know, using uh, a, you know, scripting language to get through this rather than having to go through those stores that you showed us and, you know, knowing yeah. which stores which and, you know, the confusion that exists and, you know, developers don't spend a lot of time uh, doing that, but uh, to be able to provide that. So thank you very much.